Greetings once again. It's a pleasure to be back and to share with you some of the insights I've had gained over the last couple of weeks and also some interesting projects that we did a while back. So today I'm going to talk about reflections and insights on designing a robust patient access program. And I believe that patient access programs are critical and are essential in terms of delivery of healthcare solutions in whichever location that you're working with. And most especially, very critically in these locations where dealing with low income communities where access to healthcare services is a challenge. And as much as we're looking at access in a low income, low income societies as a challenge because of the financing and the resourcing capabilities, we also need to look at access programs as novel strategies that can also serve in the high end areas where people need access to services that might not be available to them because of other determining factors that I'm going to talk about. And the most critical bit is to look at how do we then as stakeholders within the healthcare space deliver solutions that are meeting the needs of that particular community, that's a group of patients. So this actually program is, this particular video is informed by some work that I did a while back. That was in 2020 from October to 2021 March, six month pilot program that was engaged through the agriculture, health and social innovation. And this project was being done in a primary health facility in the, within Nairobi County, where we were looking at improving access to medicines for people, patients living with diabetes and hypertension. So when we look at it, the first thing that we need to ask ourselves, what are patient access programs? So patient access programs are designed schemes that are supposed to help patients access healthcare solutions and interventions. And most of them have always been around financing solutions. And that's where you'll find some of them are where pharmaceutical companies producing innovative medicines and any other pharmaceutical products that are needed by patients would give price incentives where we have, let's like, say, for example, tokens, rebates, and all that and even capping the prices at a particular level so that patients are able to afford them. And one of such products can also be included in the current problems we are looking at gene therapies and novel therapies that patients need. For example, with patients we are having degenerative disorders and you find the only gene therapies that are available might be substantially expensive that they're not able to pay. And therefore it gets to a point that pharmaceutical companies partner with the different insurance, health insurance companies, governments and related, and even patient support programs so that they design interventions and design packages that are able to ensure any patient who needs such kind of a medical intervention will be able to access it. And that is where we are talking of access. So patient access programs are novel schemes and innovative models of healthcare delivery, where the focus is on ensuring that patients who need healthcare services are able to obtain them, receive them where they need them, when they need them, without suffering the financial hardships or actually not being limited. And that is why we're looking at patient access as an enabler to universal healthcare coverage, because we're talking, when we talk about UHC, we're talking about accessibility, availability, affordability, without suffering the financial constraint that might push people to poverty. So at the end of the day, we want everybody to be able to afford a decent life, standard of living. So with that, no, looking at that as patient access program, then the question that we need to ask ourselves is why patient access program? And when we talk about patient access programs, we already know that we are looking at people have being able to access healthcare services when and where they need them. So you need to ask yourself, why is it that somebody might not be able to access the healthcare services that they need? One, we talk about unmet needs. We know that all the healthcare solutions that we're talking about they are driven by innovations and design of medical products and services that people are able to use. It can be including a product that might not be available at that particular moment. For example, when you talk about cancers, earlier days when we didn't have anti-cancers, then there was an unmet need. People were dying of cancers, but there were no medications to help treat these medicines. And therefore, in an access program, you need to look at how do we then innovate and create a new product that would help us meet that particular need that is not being met through our current innovations and current portfolio products that are being designed. And if at all, let's say, for example, it's an innovation that is not reaching people, let's say, for example, assistance innovation, then you need to be asking yourself, how do we bridge the gap between where we are currently working to ensure people are able to access medicines when and where they are without suffering additional content? Let's say, for example, they have to go to a hospital, queue for an hour and all that. What is the innovation that we can put there? That is where we're now talking about telemedicine, patient risk program, diagn medical diagnostics, remote modeling of this, uh, healthcare delivery. What are these options? So that the innovation is enabling us to reach people who are not reached because of a gap in our innovation. Therefore, that is one bit. The other aspect of patient access program would be looking at the limited access where people have limited access because of affordability. A patient is not able to pay for the healthcare services. So if they're not able to pay, they would go to a hospital where the services are being offered. 
but because of their inability to afford, they'll go back home with either half dose, no dose, or actually fail to go to the hospital because they're not even assured of getting to the hospital. Maybe they are not able to have their fare and all that. So how do we reach them where they are without suffering additional constraints? They go to a hospital for them to get optimal care. There is need for the diagnostic, uh, as a diagnostics. They're not able to afford diagnostics and therefore they'll opt for empirical treatment. Empirical treatment might work or might not work because we are not targeting our therapy to the particular solution that the patient needs. Reason, we are not able to diagnose. They have limited financing and that is a challenge. So what are the other limitations that can be there? Availability. We don't look, say for example, we're talking about access to healthcare and those are some communities might not be having hospitals closer to them. So how do we bridge the gap of availability of hospitals and healthcare services closer to them? Then the other bit would be in terms of underserved communities. We have a hospital in a community, but you realize some of them lack specialized services. For example, it's just a primary health center. Primary health center will offer the basic of primary health care services, but fail to offer specialized care. Therefore, you find in such a location, people who have se severe conditions that might need additional specialized care, like a uh, use of an, having neurologists in space, and uh, oncologists, gynecologists, and related. When such specialists are not available, those are marginalized communities because I am part of a community where well, the burden of infections that are happening are being managed by the primary health care services. But for me, as an underserved, as a marginalized community, I'm not able to get the services. You're working in a community where we have deaf people. These deaf people could break barrier in communication. If we don't have a specialized sign language translator in the hospital, or even the healthcare workers who are able to communicate through sign language, then it will be a barrier for them to access services. So how do we reach them? And those are the kind of things that we need to look at when we're talking about patient access program. So what are the essentials in designing an robust and actually effective patient access program? One, having clarity on access gaps. You need to know what are the needs in this particular community? Is it because there are met needs in terms of innovation shortfalls, limited access because of availability, accessibility, or affordability of care? Or are we having another sub community that is in that particular location that needs services, but their services are not available to them? so that we know and have a clear purpose on what are we going to do. Then in that space, we also need to know which healthcare intervention are we designing. The same case that I talk about when I'm looking at, let's say, the epidemiological patterns. If I'm going to a malaria endemic zone, then my intervention would be on malaria. Then once I know my intervention is around malaria to ensure that I improve the access to care, for example, it's a malaria endemic zone. Most of the people in that, children in that community under five are dying because of malaria. Severe, severe malaria, then we look at it in terms of why, how does it get to the point where the, the child, we know there's treatment plans for malaria, there's intervention that can be done for malaria. But at the end of the day, the children are still dying of malaria. How do we support them? Maybe diagnostics is, there's a shortfall in diagnostic. There's lack of preventive measure, the use of treatment mosquito nets and related. Or probably they don't have access to the medication they need, the specialized medication for the treatment of severe malaria, or even we don't have clinicians who are equipped to be, to be able to serve that kind of a population. So we need to know this is the current burden and that's why we're having more death because of it. Then how do we look at that continuum of management? And then once we design that solution, we key on, this is the patient population that we're addressing. This is where the need is. We have to find out, well, these people, their preventive measures are working through the public health programs, but, there's a shortfall in diagnostics, and therefore we need to partner with actually companies that are working in rapid diagnostics, but if we are one of them, then that is the key intervention that we are able to support. Optimizing diagnosis. And optimizing diagnosis is not only providing diagnostic kits, it's providing the diagnostic kits or finding a way to make them available, but at the same time, equipping healthcare providers to be able to diagnose and use these kits to assess, this, to determine whether the patient is suffering from malaria or not, and also to know what therapies to use. Because once you diagnose, you need to manage. If they're good at managing, ensure you give them the diagnostic kits, enable them to diagnose, and then help them treat. And that is a case that actually I had noted when at one point when I was working at Kenyatta National Hospital, where I was looking at management of patients suffering from visceral leishmaniasis. And the key was patients are suffering from visceral leishmania, but when they're being referred from their local communities, there is a gap. They're being referred with a suspicion of other infections other than visceral leishmania, but yet this is the condition they're suffering from. So what is the level of clinical suspicion? The diagnostics, do they have access to diagnostics? Then after diagnosis, do we have medication to support the patients? 
if they are being considered to be sick of suffering from malaria for a period of a month or two or even three, we get the visceral leishmaniasis, then it means we are actually derailing them from accessing the care, delaying access to care that they need. So that is there's an access gap there. Then the next bit would be on clarity on patient decision journey. And when you talk about patient decision journey, the key for us is you need to know this is the patient that I want to serve. For example, when I'm talking about malaria and it's in children under five years, these, these children don't go to hospital by themselves. And therefore, when they go to hospital, they are being taken by their mothers or their guardians, whichever way, but there's someone involved. So in understanding the patient decision journey, you need to ask yourself, for this particular child, for them to get to the hospital or to get to the healthcare system, where does the patient start? Do they go to the pharmacy? Do they go to the hospital straight away for diagnosis? Or at what point do they actually get to the start point of managing this condition? Some of the cases actually, the common patient decision journey that I've gotten accustomed to in our local context is a patient when I'm feeling unwell, slightly unwell, I'll go to a community pharmacy, buy some medicines, probably painkillers just for symptom pain relief, symptomatic management. Then that, if that fails, the next phase for me would be come back to the pharmacy and explain that, well, I bought this kind of medicines from you that they didn't work for me. So I'm hoping you can get me another medication. The pharmacist or even the patient might already have self-prescribed what they need through Dr. Google. That is one of the key thing drivers in terms of actually patient management now. So once they know what they want to take, they would go back to the pharmacy. The pharmacist might help them prescribe medicine empirically and help them support that care. Or they can come with already a preformed opinion on what kind of medicine they need. They might buy it or might not buy, depending on the, whether the pharmacist will be willing to give the medication or not. If they use this medication and get relief, that is the end of their patient journey. But if they don't get relief, they'll come back to the pharmacist again, or they'll go to the hospital. If they come to the pharmacist, they'll be sent for lab test and diagnostics. That is where now they come in touch with a hospital or a laboratory, medical laboratory services. Or they'll go to a hospital where now special diagnostics are performed. That is the third phase. Then from the third phase, they'll be sent back to the pharmacy where they're going to buy their medicines or they're going to fill their prescription as been prescribed. And therefore, that is the patient decision journey. So you need to ask yourself, across this patient decision journey, aim is one, to ensure these patients have access to the care that they need when and where it's needed. That is one key bit. After acknowledging that is where we have to play, then you need to ask yourself, if this is the journey, what, is, what, we, what area, what point in this decision journey can I intervene the patient journey? At what point can I intervene to actually serve them better so that I shorten their care period? If I'm going to leave them to come to the hospital, that is when they'll get care. It will be after three interactions with the healthcare system through the community pharmacies. But if I go to the community pharmacies, I'll actually address this issue at the initial moment. When they first present with symptoms, we do diagnostics, let's say, for example, testing for kids using the rapid diagnostic kit for malaria. We diagnose malaria, start them on atemethylomephantine combination therapies, that is for mod moderate malaria, then instantly we know that kind of uncomplicated malaria, we already know this patient is going to get the help they need. So therefore they're recovering at first. The mother has time to go back to her work or, her, or his work or the father in that case. So that is already a bonus because you've shortened the care journey, the care period for the patient. And it's because you understand the decision journey and you're intervening at the point that they really need that intervention. Then healthcare service delivery pathways. You need to ask yourself, across the healthcare continuum, who are delivering healthcare services? Which are the options that are available? How do we support them? And what makes patients decide on which part of the stakeholder to deliver to go to for services? They don't want to go to the public hospital, probably I'll have to wait for so long. I go to, I don't know, they don't want to go to the private health facilities because the cost of care is substantially high. So once you know all those service delivery, pharmacy, private hospitals, community, public hospitals, delay time, that is an inconvenience. The cost and affordability. The community pharmacies, convenience, cost of medicine, they don't have to incur additional charges in terms of consultation and all that. Then that's why they go there. So you need to know what makes a patient go to a pharmacy instead of a hospital. And what will make a patient actually go to a pharmacy instead of a public hospital or a private hospital, then how do I reach them? If I want them to go to the private hospital, to the public hospital, definitely we don't want them to go to either of any of those. But when we want is to ensure that if they go to any of those three, they're able to get the care they need. So once we know that, we know the pathway to intervene to, to support and actually the people to work with. Then the next bit is in having an established internal capability assessment. 
as an organization, and this is what we looked at from a culture when we were going to engage with this particular community in Kasarani Health Center. We knew that most of our work has been around health research, communication, advocacy, and patient education. And that research is about generating new evidence and designing best practices for healthcare delivery. So when we realized that was our capability and we are people who have the technical know-how in terms of education, then what we could offer at that point was the health education and supporting patients in terms of the healthcare decision journey. So we would partner with the hospital, we would anchor them as a patient support group. Then other than that, we have stakeholders who are helping with registration. We looked at for how to source for medication that came into place. So what is my capability as an organization? What am I able to offer? If it's a pharmaceutical company, they're able to provide the medicine because most of the care is delivered through use of medicine. So that is their capability. Then we need to ask ourselves, for the ultimate intervention for patients to get access, they don't only need medicines. They need somebody who they can diagnose and actually confirm they need this medicine. That is one. Two, they need somebody who can give them the medicine. That is the prescription. If it's a medicine that can be taken by themselves, that is good. If it's an injectable, a procedure that needs to be performed, somebody has to be equipped to be able to perform that procedure. If I'm a pharmaceutical company, I'm not able to do that. Therefore, I need to partner with other clinicians, physicians, or even pharmacists to do that additional work. Then we need the monitoring. Do we have community health workers who can support the patients in their patient journey if they need additional palliative support? So what is our internal capability and who do we need? And that is who we need is now coming to the next phase we are talking about environmental awareness and clarity on stakeholders and what is their space in that care? How do, who do I need? What can they offer? How do we make the best of that solution that they are having? Then finally, we have to have a strategic alignment on our internal capabilities, the patient needs and access program priority. Our access program priority for the example that I've been using around malaria is to ensure people have access to right malaria therapy and management at the right time when they need it, for example, for children under five years, to ensure, one, to reduce the burden, that is in terms of death, mortality, that we're having for children under five years in particular location, depending on the biological patterns. Then that, after that, the next bit is, that is our priority. What that is the patient needs in that case would be diagnostics, or even if not diagnostic, access to the medicines when and where they need them. Not only medicine, but quality effective medicines when they need them. Then once we know that and we know our capabilities, we are producing these medicines, now we look at how to design that solution and we have that strategic alignment. If I'm going to intervene in terms of supporting patients with malaria in a particular location, and that is my interest, then as a pharma company, if I'm only producing anti-diabetic medication, there's no strategic alignment. Therefore, I'm not able to deliver additional support. The only support I could give maybe is to work with my counterparts within the pharmaceutical industry to get someone who can provide the medicines in their capability and act as a support, kind of a facilitator, an enabler. So you need to ask, what is the key capabilities that I have within myself to be able to support this program? And how do I make it work? What do the patients need? What, do we, what is our access priority? And how do we align with our internal capabilities and then we'll see what other stakeholders can offer and how we make it happen. So when I look at it in terms of designing a robust patient access program and looking at strategic place of community pharmacies, as I mentioned in the patient decision journey, the patient journey, we know that we have three touch points where the pharmacies are involved. First point, symptomatic. Second, self-diagnosis. The fourth, when we talk about referral, actually refill of prescription and filling of prescriptions, dispensing of medications. So in our design, we need to ask ourselves, what is the current need? And I'm going to use the example of the Kasarani Health Center. We realized that most of the patients that were coming to the hospital with their bodies or hypertension, they were being seen, prescription written, but they were being sent to community pharmacies to buy their medicines because almost every time we have out of stock for this medication. So what we need to, needed to work on was ensure we have access to medicines, reliable access to medicine. So then the first point is, ensuring the medication is available for the patient. So whenever they come to the hospital, they're assured they'll get the medicine. That is first phase. The second phase, after knowing that they were able to get the medicine, we know that diabetes management, hypertension management, is not only about the medicine. It's about actually having an optimal monitoring of the patient variables, participant parameters, that is the blood sugar, blood pressure levels, and even seeing the well-being of the patient and what are the other contributing factors, the lifestyle modification components. So as a culture, we were able to support in terms of the health education, lifestyle modification, advice, and counseling therapy. But other than that, when the medicines were now available, they have a pull factor. So they are already coming to the hospital. 
when they're coming to the hospital, we give them the medication of additional, additional add-on services that is done for health, patient and health education. The next, we're moving to the next phase of medicines reconciliation. These patients are coming to use antihypertensive or antidiabetic medicines, but they're already using other additional, let's say, for example, the conventional therapy, complementary medicines that they're gathering from their communities, or even managing another condition. So we have comorbidities. Can we do medicines reconciliation to ensure there's no drug-drug interaction in this kind of a care? That is the next phase. The third phase would be now medication therapy optimization. We've reconciled and known that this patient has the right combination of medicines they need. And once we know that, now we are working to ensure for the medicine they're using that they need, they're getting the best out of them. Are they improving in terms of their conditions? That is where we can all look at diagnostic partnering with labs and all that. And from an organizational perspective, from a personal perspective, as an organization perspective as well, both Agriculture and Africa Pharmaceutical Network are the same kind of projects that we're looking at is, can pharmacies play a role there? Yes. From the patient decision journey, community pharmacies are strategically located to serve communities, and that is why we have most contact with them. So how do we build capability in them to be able to work on such interventions? How do we position them to work and serve communities? And ultimately, to be an anchor for the entire healthcare ecosystem, when we look at it from pharma companies wanting to partner with communities, can they come through the community pharmacies? Can we enable them to do that in serving their communities? Rather than designing interventions, which will be positioned in healthcare service delivery pathways where patients don't reach out to as much as we would have wished to. And therefore, that is also actually going to lead, lead to limited access, which is one of the drivers on why we would design a patient access program. So from an organizational perspective, we believe this are doable, and that is what we are currently working on designing a solution for. And we'd be glad to work with you and see how we can support this journey together in improving access to healthcare services for the people that want it. If you feel like you, need, you have something that you want to share with us, you want to engage with us on such kind of a patient access program, reach out to African Pharma Network at, at gmail.com. We are willing to partner with you and engage. If you find this video informative, insightful for you, please share, like, subscribe to the channel, and let's engage and learn more as we improve access to care to patients who need them by optimizing the pharmacy delivery pathways. Thank you so much. See you next Sunday.